This is a cultural event from the British Library. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the British Library tonight for John Gray, Cats, Humans and the Good Life. My name is Susanna Stevenson, and I'm one of the cultural events producers here at the library, where I've had the very fun job of taking the exhibition that we currently have on in the entrance hall um, and building a programme of events around it. I shared a story with John earlier in the green room about the fact that this all came from the fact that I heard his Desert Island Discs, in which he mentioned that he had a cat and was intrigued by their relationship with humans, at which point he received an email. Um, it, tonight's event is just one of a series of talks inspired by the exhibition Cats on the Page. Um, so do take a look at the brochures you have and see if there are any others you'd like to come and see. And the exhibition is on until the 17th of March, so don't miss your chance to see it if you haven't already. Um, I'll just briefly summarise the format of this evening. In a moment, I'll ask John Gray to come to the stage and he will speak for around 50 minutes or so. Um, I will then reappear and we'll have a Q&A with all of you. So if you find any questions brewing, please do hold on to them because your moment will come. So now it, it just remains for me to introduce John Gray properly. He is a political philosopher with interests in analytic philosophy and the history of ideas. He retired in 2008 as school professor of European thought at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He contributes regularly to The Guardian, The Times Literary Supplement, and The New Statesman, where he is the lead book reviewer. I hope you enjoy the talk this evening, and please welcome John Gray. Well, thank you for all, all of you for coming to hear what I, my thoughts about cats. I should add that um, the cat that we have at the moment is um, one long versed in the ways of humans. He's 22 years old at his next birthday. Whether he's learned anything of value <laughs> during those 20 years of close connection with humans, I'm not so sure because one thing my own observations of cats, I've had many other cats too, uh, is that um, cats, unlike a certain kind of human, the kind of human who originally gave me the idea of the book I'm now writing on, Cats and the Meaning of Life, <laughs> who was the kind of person uh, who believed very strongly in human reason and was a, a philosopher uh, many years ago, the kind of person who first implanted this uh, um, idea in, in my mind of writing a book on cats that now several de decades later I am I'm doing believed that human beings were guided by reason in their lives or could be, and he was himself, as almost inevitably that would follow in some aspects of his life, at least completely irrational. Um, and the, the, the part of his life where um, his irrationality was, to me, most revealed was in his relationship with his own cat, um, which he uh, assured me one evening in what I then thought was a joke he had, this was about 30 years ago, he had persuaded to become a vegan. <laughs> now, vegan cats have always been, shall we say, rare. <laughs> and the idea of persuading a cat of, to become a vegan um, has perhaps even been rarer until recently where it's now seriously proposed and even practiced by a number of people, but then it was unusual. And so originally I thought it was a joke, so I smilingly said, you must have had some very persuasive arguments. And he said, yes, I did. <laughs> um, I pursued the conversation a little while until I saw him getting angry and I realized that it wasn't a joke. He really had convinced himself that his cat was vegan. Um, I didn't go into many details, but towards the end of our increasingly rather tense conversation, I asked him, I said, did your cat go out? <laughs> Capital O. And he said, yes, so QED. Uh, uh, what I imagine was happening is that the cat went to some other owner who was less, shall we say, besotted with 
reason and with morality, a certain conception of morality, or caught things in the garden and possibly even brought them back, but vegan philosophers or may not, perhaps not be the most observant people in the world. <laughs> uh, uh, what does this illustrate? Well, certainly it illustrates a feature of cats, which is that cats are quickly convinced of the incurable irrationality of humans. Um, but they'd never, even if they could, they would never try and persuade by reason humans to stop being unreasonable. They would take for granted that humans are so unreasonable that no reason could stop them from being unreasonable. So they simply adapt their behavior. If it becomes too trying or boring, they leave. Um, I don't know if the cat ever. So that planted the idea in my mind 30 years ago of writing this book, and uh, our own cat seems to have long accepted that we are unreasonable, but we're reasonable enough, my wife and I, when we look after him, for him to forgive us our human status and our unreasonableness, and um, he seems to have had and have a happy life. Now, what did that, that um, actual event, that actual episode that did, in fact, uh, happen to me, illustrate some of the themes I'm going to try, or thoughts that I'm going to try and address at night? I'm not a scientist of cats. I'm not a, a zoologist. Um, I've read much, lots of books about cats and had many cats, but these are simply thoughts that I've had over the years which have been um, germinated in me by, my, uh, by living with cats. And uh, they really fall into three categories. The first is cats and morality. Uh, the second is uh, cats and happiness. And the third is cats and us. Now, I suppose when one talks about cats and morality, the first thing people say, well, cats have no morality, they would say. Cats are always thought to be amoral. And people who say this um, have, like the philosopher I described a moment ago, they have a very clear idea in their mind, or they think it's a very clear idea in their mind, of what morality is. They think they know what morality is. Um, it's a set of principles, perhaps, or rules, or uh, values, which they're never quite clear where they come from. If they're religious, perhaps they come from God. If they're not religious, it's less clear where they come from. They might say humanity or humankind, but of course, humankind, human beings have had many different moralities. Uh, there's an enormously wide variation. The moralities of Sparta and the moralities of Athens, for example, uh, in human history. And, uh, but they're very clear in their minds, people who think like this, of what morality is. But in fact, I think even in the relatively narrow cultural space of Western civilization, there are at least two different conceptions of morality and what's sometimes called ethics. There's the one I've just described, which is that um, morality consists of like a series of laws, essentially, it's kind of a legal uh, conception or a system of principles which we must obey. And um, I think this is important. I think it comes from uh, Jewish and Christian sources. And although I'm an atheist myself, I think these are very valuable and precious um, traditions that have contributed a lot to our civilization and we'd be greatly impoverished without them. But they're not the only way of thinking about the good life. They're not the only way of thinking about how to live. And in other traditions um, outside of the Western civilization, Chinese Taoism, for example, or within Western civilization, the ancient Greeks didn't think of the good life in quite that way. They didn't think of it in terms of obeying laws. They didn't even think that morality marked out a special part of human life. We, te we tend to think of morality as a kind of uh, special, weighty, terribly important, immensely valuable kind of part of human life. In fact, as the supreme kind of locus, the supreme uh, kind of value in human life, as if it's separate from every everything else. But actually, if you read back into Aristotle even, not one of my favorite philosophers for many reasons, but if you read back into Aristotle, the way he thought of ethics, he used this other word, uh, was the way most Greeks thought of it at that time, which was the art of life. So ethics was whatever you needed to live well, and that would include hygiene, beauty, what we now call aesthetics. It would include lots of areas of life that we don't think of as being moral, of having not, nothing much to do with morality. Whatever was needed to live a good life was part of ethics. Now, one good feature of Aristotle is that even back then, 2,500 years ago, he didn't restrict ethics entirely to human beings. 
in Aristotle, long before there were ideas of um, speciesism or uh, anti-speciesism or um, animal rights, he talks about the ethics of dolphins. He says dolphins have virtues. What are virtues? Virtues are things you need to live well. And to live well, he thought, meant to realize to your nature, to realize your nature. So the dolphins, being dolphins, <coughs> needed certain virtues of courage, bravery, cooperation, uh, trust among themselves to live well as dolphins. And um, so too did human <coughs> beings. Now, the downside of Aristotle, there are many downsides of Aristotle, is that basically he was writing for middle-aged Greek property-owning males, which was a relatively small part of the human species even at that time. <laughs> uh, so, um, and there's also something when you read him, when you read him on friendship, I mean, when he says a friend uh, uh, is, is someone who mirrors yourself, I often, when reading, I think, well, why would it have been simpler just to buy a mirror and sit and look at yourself all day? <laughs> um, that's not been my experience of friendship. Mine has been that people are very different from the way I am, have been very often the most valuable friends. So I don't, in general, find him an, an inspiring moral philosopher. But in this respect, he's very interesting because he sees ethics, the art of life, as something which all species can practice. It's not, uh, they can't deliberate about it, maybe the way we do, they can't ponder it uh, about the, the, the way the, that we do, but, they, but other species like dolphins and like cats, um, though he doesn't mention cats, can, uh, can have virtues. And cats, I think, are like that. Now, of course, one feature of cats, relevant to any book on cats and philosophy or the meaning of life, is that cats don't need philosophy. Uh, there's no known feline philosophy. Um, and I think they don't need it. Why don't they need it? Because they already know how to live. From a kind of feline point of view, you might say that needing a philosophy or a religion is a human frailty, a human weakness. It's because we don't know how to live uh, that we need to think about it and philosophize about it and take up religions. And also, as far as we know, there are no cat religions. One thing we can be absolutely certain is that they don't regard us as deities. <laughs> Humans have regarded cats as deities, the ancient Egyptians, of course, but there's no known instance of that being ever reversed. Um, of course, <coughs> Ethics of cats uh, are shown in their relationship to their, to their kittens. Uh, they uh, go to great lengths to protect their kittens, sacrifice their lives for their kittens. Um, and in that sense, you might say they're altruistic. And we tend to think of ethics nowadays in terms of altruism. Ethics means, or morality means, um, 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 caring for others. And that's, of course, one of the arguments people give for cats being immoral, they say, well, they don't care for other cats, it doesn't seem, unless they're, they're kittens, and they don't really care, many people say, for humans. They want certain things from humans, and to the extent that they get these things from humans, they exhibit affection, but it's kind of switched on and off, and it's not really um, true. I think this is a mistake. I'll talk a bit about that more later, but I think cats can have genuine affection for us and even love us. But unlike humans, they can love us without needing us. That's to say, they can walk away. They have their own lives, they're independent. Um, their lives have the meaning they have, and I'll talk about that a bit more, independently of us. So they don't need humans in the way that we humans sometimes need other humans to provide our lives with a meaning. And that's actually part of my main thought tonight, which I'll try and develop, which is that the secret of feline happiness is that cats don't tell their lives as stories. You sometimes read pe from people who may not have had cats or know them very well, they say cats live in an eternal present. They have no sense of time. Well, if you're woken up as we are twice a night at 3.30 and then 6.30, <laughs> um, you begin to doubt that because when they get hungry, they seem to remember exactly when, <laughs> when they're going to be fed. They have a sense of time, at least as it applies to their practical necessities. The key is not that whether they have a sense of time or not, or whether they live in the present or not. I don't think they do entirely, though they do more than humans. It's that cats, more than even other animals, don't find the meaning in their lives from constructing a story about their lives. And I think a very deep-seated feature 
of the human animal and the human culture is that we all tend, uh, all of us have this tendency, I think, and again, I'll try and speculate about why this is so, to find meaning in our lives to the extent that they embody a coherent story uh, told to us by ourselves, made up by our fa fashion by ourselves, or maybe one that we find ready-made in a religion or a philosophy. And to the extent that that story breaks down or is confounded by events, some dissolution of society, upheaval, or a personal uh, catastrophe or tragedy like a bereavement or um, uh, something else of that kind, to the extent that our story is disrupted, broken, to the extent that our lives, which we thought of almost like a novel or a book, we sometimes suddenly found the pages ripped out, some of the pages ripped out, and we don't know what's coming next, we're unhappy. And we're unhappy in a way which is more um, pervasive and more diffuse and more um, um, disabling to some extent than even the unhappiness which comes from <coughs> physical pain or danger because it pervades the whole of our lives. And here again, we're different from cats because the default condition of a cat is contentment or happiness. The default condition of human beings is diffuse misery. <laughs> Remember uh, Freud, some of think are now unpopular, but I, whom I greatly admire, he wrote to uh, someone that the aim of therapy, of psychoanalysis, he said, was to transform the hysterical misery of neurosis into ordinary, everyday unhappiness. <laughs> uh, might seem rather, rather limited and, and modest, but um, stoical even, but that's what he said. But it recognizes that for humans, happiness is not a natural condition. It's certainly not the default condition. For cats, it is. They're capable of unhappiness, even of great unhappiness, or suffering, obviously. Terrible things can happen to them as they can to humans. But the impact on them is different because it doesn't, that kind of, those kind of events don't fragment a story that they've either imbibed, accepted, inherited, or made up for themselves, which is then broken up by, by events. So get back to my first, cats have no morality, but it doesn't mean they don't know how to live, they do know how to live. It doesn't even mean that they have no ethics. The ethics is what it takes for them to live well. So they need to be brave, and cats are brave. They're also brave enough to be cautious. That's to say, to run away. They don't exhibit bravery in order to be praised or admired by other cats. <laughs> they run away. Uh, they're very cautious when they eat. Uh, they make sure, it's, as far as they can, that it's not poisonous. Sometimes it is anyway, but... Um, they're cautious in many ways in, in, in many of the things that they do, but they're also extremely brave. And they're extremely inventive and resourceful. In fact, according to recent studies of cats based on the, the long history of cats, based on DNA evidence, it looks as if they uh, initiated their own domestication about 12,000 years ago when they started haunting grain stores in Turkey and maybe China that humans had set up. Uh, because in grain stores, first of all, there were other living things like rats, rodents, that they could catch and kill. And they started interacting with humans. And unlike dogs, um, there is a view which says that cats, as it were, took the initiative in being domesticated. But they're not, of course, very domesticated. They're much less domesticated than... Um, there are many artificial breeds of cats, but cats, in, on the whole, have uh, become less... have not become part human the way dogs have done. And that's, I think, part of their charm for those of us who love cats, which is they're not actually mainly human in their mind. Their mind is an inhuman mind, an alien mind. And for that reason, it gives us like a window to a non-human uh, world. But Felis, Felis Silvestris, a sturdy little tabby, who seems to have emerged from uh, um, uh, Turkey about 12,000 years ago, has spread throughout the entire world on ships which went to Australia, uh, 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 it's conquered the world. Very, very successful um, uh, uh, um, animal, very successful species. And so it has the virtues which enable it to live well. And in this context, living well also includes living happily. Unless bad things happen to them, cats are happy. <laughs> Humans are not happy even if good things happen to them. Uh, because very often they have a story in which something even better should still happen, or they have a story about their whole lives ending in a successful death of some kind, 
But the fact of the matter is none of us knows how we're going to die. And that, by the way, I'll come back to that later, is I think one of the reasons, I'm only speculating, I can't prove this, but one of the reasons we are storytellers in the way that we are as humans is that um, we know we're going to die in a way that cats don't. We know our lives are finite. We know they come to an end. I mean, there are some people in California who won't accept this, of course, <laughs> including the current, including the current uh, director of engineering at Google, who's on what he describes as an inexpensive vitamin regime. It's only $1,000 a week <laughs> to keep him alive till 2040, or I think it might now be 2032. It's getting nearer as he gets older. Um, when there will be a technological transformation in which he will be rid of his frail human body, however vitamin boosted, and his mind will be uploaded into cyberspace where he will be immortal. But unless you share that view, uh, the, uh, and, uh, the, or unless you're religious, which in some strong way, uh, in, in a type of religion which values immortality, which not all religions do actually, but it is one which thinks that humans can, can or will be immortal, the common human experience is to know that you are going to die and that your lives and your days and your years are limited. Um, and that, I think, uh, is one of, the, uh, imp one of the factors, one of the forces that turns us into storytellers. If we didn't know that, if we didn't have a vivid sense of that, which even elephants, though they seem to um, gather around dead elephants, don't seem to have in their own cases, they don't seem to have a sense of their lives as being measured out in three score, 10, or even with four score, five score, six score, and 10, as technology enables us to live longer. We know they're finite. And that seems to um, be one of the factors to me the awareness of our mortality, which makes us into storytellers, which makes us want to tell a coherent story of the whole of our lives, which we know will come, each of them, to an end. The trouble is we don't know, any of us, how they will end. And so there's an element of pretense and also an element of deep anxiety in this, because as I said earlier, when something goes wrong, we tend to suffer uh, very badly. Um, so I'll move on, as it were, to, to cat happiness. <laughs> The happiness of cats. And I guess one book here, which I mentioned to you, it's a very long book, and it's not mostly about the cat, but the title is The Cat from Huey. Any of you ever heard of it, that book, The Cat from Huey? It's written by a, an American um, war correspondent who, uh, as a relatively young man, spent uh, a lot of time in Vietnam. And while he was in Vietnam, he um, adopted a Vietnamese cat in the city of Huey, which is, some of you who may remember about Vietnam was a city, a beautiful uh, um, Vietnamese city, which was pretty well completely destroyed in the course of the Vietnam War. He adopted the cat, he took it to America, took it to London, and although the cat, although the cat always had a certain grumpiness and mistrustfulness about human beings, not surprising, being surrounded by, in its early months and years by sounds of gunfire and people dropping dead beside it, um, it grew to trust him and love him, it seemed, and it's a story of partly about his own life as a war correspondent, but partly about that cat. You might want to look at his name is John Lawrence. Um, now, why is that relevant? Well, one of the things, I guess, that occurred to me when I was reading the book is that, as any of us would do, we would all do this, we would try to make sense of our time in Vietnam. We try to construct some, fear, some story of what we were doing there and what the war was for and how it worked out, which didn't make it into a completely meaningless farce. I mean, I think the, uh, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, Irish poet Seamus Heaney says, people ask what the logic of history is. He said it does of human history. He said it's got perfectly clear logic. It's the logic of an abattoir. Um, so you're out there or you're among the, the sheep or the, the killers of the sheep, the, the butchers of the sheep you be one or the other at any at one time and then switch to another. We'd, be, we'd struggle, and of course, many of the young Americans who came back, came back um, psychologically damaged. Um, there were more people, more Americans in the, who'd served in the uh, Vietnam, Vietnam War uh, who, who came back and committed suicide than there were who died in the Vietnam War. Many of them came back with strange, strong addictions, and of course, countless more Vietnamese in that war um, seeing their homes, their cities, their forests destroyed, would not quickly or ever recover from it. Um, they'd be traumatized. Now, cats 
can also be traumatized. But what struck me in this story is that the cat was traumatized, but it, it, let, it was able to leave it behind to a large degree, more than a human could. And I don't interpret that as many would say, well, it's just less well-developed than humans. Cats are, they've got less cognitive abilities. Maybe they don't remember things the way we do. I think the reason was more that cats have not developed, don't have, um, maybe couldn't have, but don't have this, this need to turn their lives and even human history as a whole um, into um, a coherent narrative, a coherent story. Bad things happen, you recover from them if you can, you go on and you enjoy the next day. Um, uh, I once was talking to another philosopher who said, but on the, along these lines, a different philosopher too, who said to me, but you must remember, John, that cats have no history the way we do. And I said, you regard that as an advantage of ours. Is history so wonderful? When you look back at history, it's so wonderful that, you know, cats are deeply impoverished. They can't say, well, we cats first, of course, discovered the pleasure of fish in the Egyptian period. <laughs> at that time, we knew very little about uh, the, true, the true delicacy of fish. We, we just walked it down. Later on, we became gourmets of fish. <laughs> Um, we often refused fish, offered, they do actually, <laughs> sometimes cats offered by humans as not being to our taste, but at that time we were pretty undeveloped as cats. Uh, it's only over many centuries and long struggles that we've progressed to the point at which we now have this highly developed taste in fish that we have. No, cats don't think like that. Um, but they're, then they're, they're also, of course, for that reason, they're not dependent on historical narratives that can, not only the narratives of our own lives, each of our lives, we each have narratives of our own lives. We also have big historical narratives which tell us that the future, how the future is going to be. So they tell us that uh, there'll be more of good things, there'll be more justice, more liberty, more freedom, more prosperity. What uh, uh, some politicians call the arc of justice will gradually tilt, not inevitably, not quickly, but there'll be, there'll be periods of, in which it slides back, in which uh, you have periods of regression. But over a long history, the idea is that there is a, a gradual story slowly working out. Now, if you begin to get the feeling, which I suspect quite a lot of people do now, that that narrative may not be entirely accurate, <laughs> that there may be sudden rapid losses of gains that have been accumulated over centuries very hard to gain, or generations that suddenly vanish in the, in the blink of an eye, and that they might not come back during your lifetime or even your children's lifetime. Once that seeps into the soul, it's very difficult for humans to adapt to that. And characteristically, I don't want to sound pessimistic, far from me to be pessimistic, um, they become rather wild and desperate and irrational. And it's in those times that people tend to turn to dictators and demagogues and persecutions because they want to, they're terrified by, and there may be practical reasons too, by the way, like there were in the 1930s, there may be huge inflations. I remember reading about old people in Berlin during the great inflation of uh, uh, the interwar period, and when they were asked their address, the number of their street, they said, uh, instead of saying 22 so-and-so strasher, they said 22 billion, 3 million and 550,000, the street number, because suddenly, uh, the the, the, the uh, denominations of the notes that they used every day gone into millions, and were so we go get this rot so it can be practical as well as spiritual or psychological. And when that happens, when things we've not only grown used to and habituated to, but expect to be in the future, suddenly vanish, or it looks as if they'll vanish, and we don't know what's going to come next. The story breaks down, not just our own personal story, but the historical narrative, history. History as a sort of repository of meaning breaks down and the normal reaction to that is fear. And a common reaction to that fear is to look around for a savior of some kind and that often turns out to be um, a dictator or a tyrant or someone offering some quick and easy solution. And quick and easy solutions, if you want a general rule, generally involve killing large numbers of people. <laughs> That'll do it, never does actually, but uh, not much is learned from that. Well, in the world of cats, which is a world, if not of the internal present, but a world different from the human world in that uh, they live um, according to the pleasures of the day and the satisfactions of the day and the long sleeps they take in between the days. 
none of this um, occurs. So I don't see the absence of a history. I don't see the lack of a history of, of a feline history of improvement, a uh, feline history in 12 volumes. I don't see that as a loss, necessarily. They certainly don't, anyway. Um, so, and this also has another side, which is that although terrible things can happen to cats, as may have happened to the cat from Huey, um, the cat's lives can't be tragic in the way that human lives can be tragic. Now, you can see this as a loss, because you can say that what's, um, in a sense, valuable, even about a tragic life, is that it's some kind of will has been asserted against some kind of struggle has been mounted by a human being, individually or collectively, against some great, uh, act of great disaster or injustice or evil. And even if it's failed, um, uh, then it uh, um, has value. And I think there's something in that, actually, that's important. I think um, you know, there are some struggles you want that humans can and have and will and do and should even um, engage in, even if they know they're going to lose even if they know they're going to be defeated. Um, it would have been better, go back to unfashionable now to talk about it, but in 1940, it would have been better to go uh, into that war in the certain knowledge that you were going to be defeated rather than, I think, to compromise and make a peace because the peace would have been sh so shameful and so um, ultimately barbarous that it would be better to, uh, um, to resist. Uh, you would show some signs of civilization go under perhaps, but it would, it would be better. So I don't see that um, tragedy as without value, but of course we can be trapped individually or collectively in our tragic stories. They, uh, there's, a, there's an interesting historical debate on historical remembrance. Should we remember, I think we should, uh, the great um, crimes and atrocities and victories and so on, on on the past. But there is a debate about it because um, uh, sometimes they can prevent a society um, moving on. Cats don't have uh, any of these uh, problems. The basic kind of uh, um, uh, thought I'm having here is that if you want to be happy in the way that cats are happy, you have to forget the stories which you as a human being think will make you happy. Uh, you have to put aside those stories because they're, ve they're necessarily fragile in relation to the events of life. So maybe, by the way, I think the least fragile, what my friend Nassim Tal would call anti-fragile stories, are stories from traditional religions because they're not falsifiable in the way that stories that we now... If you have a story which tells you that if you take up a certain therapy, you'll be all right in certain ways, and it doesn't work, that's pretty fragile. Spent ten thousand dollars, as someone told me. I spent ten thousand dollars on that damn therapist, and I feel worse now than I did when I started. That's a fairly. Uh, I'm not saying it always works like that, but fragile stories um, are ones that depend on um, events in the world, which can easily go the wrong way. Less fragile ones um, may depend on religious beliefs, and uh, I'm not a religious believer myself or practitioner, but beliefs which can't be. Um, 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 fragile uh, in that way. And it's interesting if you read about how people survive in extreme conditions in uh, camp concentration camps and other extreme conditions, you often find that um, uh, those with, uh, uh, they're not the only ones, but those with strong commitment to uh, um, uh, a religious um, narrative of their lives, ending, of course, not with death, but going on after death, last longer. Though that's open to a Criticism uh, in one of Solzhenitsyn's um, stories about the Soviet gulag, he has one of his characters, Ivan Dilizovich, ask another one in the bunk. The other one says, well, God sent me here. That's why I'm happy. And the character, Ivan Dilizovich, he says, fine, but why am I here? <laughs> um, so it doesn't always, uh, doesn't always, as it were, give the kind of deep peace that uh, 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 it's it required. What does this non-storytelling approach to life give you? Well, first of all, cats have no regrets. They don't spend their lives wondering what they've lost. Um, Freud, again, back to Freud, said that the uses of fiction, we thought we all tended to fiction in our lives, magical thinking and fiction, in the way we thought about our lives, are they provide us with the possible lives we might have wanted or desired but didn't have. That's why we're like that. Um, 
uh, Kierkegaard, Danish philosopher, um, wrote that however a human lives, a human being lives, he or she will regret part of our life. I don't know whether that's true. Um, uh, I've always thought that Edith Piaf might have regretted a bit too much, but uh, <laughs> she, she, she says things so passionately about not regretting. It's, in time, it's not always possible to believe that. She didn't regret. And maybe we have reasons for regrets, but we don't live in regret uh, if we're wise. And if we're wise, we can learn something from cats in, in, that, uh, in, in that respect. Now, this kid takes me to another kind of very important point about cats and about humans. Humans, I think, can't avoid protecting an image of themselves as they pass through their lives. We have a self-image, an image not of us that, that we recognize in a mirror. Cats don't recognize their image in the mirror. Um, uh, um, other animals, non-human animals, can and do. Certain types of apes, for example, uh, can recognize themselves, but cats don't. But more generally, uh, quite apart from their physical appearance, um, cats don't have what we all have, which is an image of ourselves as we wish to be or would like to be um, or like to be seen to be, which we protect through thick and thin. And this is a feature, I think, just a feature of being human. Um, um, we know the kind, or we think we know, the kind of person we want to be, and we think we know the kind of person we want to be seen as being. And, of course, this can lead, and very often does lead, to... Um, uh, a state of self-division. The key feature of humans, I think, as compared with other animals, and particularly with cats, is not that humans are better or worse by some standard. I don't think there is some cosmic standard of better or worse between species, not one which puts humans at the top, which is the traditional uh, Greek and uh, 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 Christian view, for example, or even one which puts cats at the top, but although I'm more tempted by that. I don't think there is one like that. I think um, uh, the good life is uh, specific to uh, particular um, uh, species. And this is one way, by the way, where ethics differs from morality. The vegan philosopher who wanted to convert his cat to veganism thought that because veganism might be the best for humans, it was the best for everyone else, all other species. Well, it might be the best for humans. I'm not saying it isn't. But it doesn't follow that it's the best for other species. If you think of ethics as being those virtues, those ways of living, that enable a particular species with a particular nature to live well. The trouble with humans is that their nature is divided. Our natures are divided in a way that other animals' natures are not. Uh, as I say, no cat, uh, no other regrets. Dogs do, as having been partly humanized, partly anthropocentized. They can show shame and embarrassment and you can tell from their behavior that they may think they've done everything wrong. Never noticed that in cats. <laughs> um, uh, but that capacity for regret or remorse or backward looking or discontent is one of the human capacities that creates the default condition of diffuse unhappiness in which humans live. Because we can always uh, regret what we've done, even if it's not bad, it might not have been the best we've done, we could have done. It might have led to some better result so we can always, we've got the capacity, the reflexive capacity to look on our impulses and regret the fact that we have certain impulses at all, regret the fact that we are what we are. And so nothing is more characteristic than humans than to want to be higher than human. Nothing is more characteristic of humans than to want not to be human, which is exactly the opposite of cats, of course, because they're delighted to be cats. <laughs> they, they want nothing else but to be cats. Humans right throughout history, if even back to Chinese alchemy, they wanted ways of kind of early Silicon Valley type thinking. They wanted to make themselves immortal. Other Taoists, by the way, maybe more philosophical Taoists, thought that uh, they, would, they welcomed death when it came because they transformed them into something different, something they welcomed death as part of a, an endless cosmic process of renewal. So they lyrically accepted death or tried to when it, when it came upon them. But generally speaking throughout human history. There are countless traditions in which humans have tried to rid themselves of part of their humanity. And not only themselves, unfortunately, but other people too, by converting them to their own uh, way of life or their own beliefs or their own worldview, their own um, ideology. And in modern times, of course, we have this through 
uh, technology. Many people want to not just live longer, but to live longer thinner, mm -hmm. uh, more beautiful, more attractive to other people, more sexy, uh, more, uh, more everything, more everything. And they think that technology can give them that along with perhaps some way of escaping um, death itself. By the way, the reason I don't think you can escape death at all is not because the technology will never exist to upload us. Maybe it will, how do I know? Might be quite soon. And certainly we all live longer already now than humans typically did. If you go back and read what Liverpool was like in the early 19th century, um, uh, the, the average lifespan, I think, taking into account child mortality was somewhere in the 20s, early 30s. Now later on you got into the 40s and I'm old enough now to remember a time when uh, most males where I grew up in the northeast of England died in their early 60s, women a couple of years later. So right in that, um, uh, even in my lifetime, there's been a huge increase in mortality and no doubt there will be uh, greater increases in future, though they may be very unequally spread. That's another kind of factor. But there won't be a technological cure of death. Why not? Well, even if you can upload a mind, a conscious mind, into cyberspace, cyberspace is a projection from the human world, not uh, part of the, not something independent of the human world. Ultimately, it'll depend on a material infrastructure, computers, various kinds of devices that do the projection. If they are destroyed in a war or a economic crash, global economic crash, uh, or a change of uh, uh, property rights in the course of a revolution, sort of thing that's happened countless times, even in the 20th century, then you can kiss goodbye to your immortality and because you'll just suddenly disappear. Um, back in the 80s, uh, get back to cats, but it's relevant to cats. I, when I lived in California, I spoke to some of the um, techno-immortalists who at that time were going to achieve technological immortality by having their bodies, or their brains at least, frozen. And I said, well, um, you know, when will the technology be around that will defreeze you without the harm that the freezing does? And they said then, because they were more modest then, they said it might be about 100 years or so. So I said, well, have you thought about what happened in the last 100 years, even just in America? Civil War, um, Great Depression, two world wars. Um, so this little company in Nevada that you're sending your remains to, your frozen head, that'll still be there. It won't have been corruptly uh, uh, closed down or had a power failure or... Uh, there won't be a, another world. Well, none of these things will happen. In other words, they said, no, no, none of those things will happen. So I admired their faith, not in this case in technology, but in human history, because what they were saying, actually, is that the institutions around them were already immortal. But historically, it's just not true. Historically, as I say, there was a big crash in the 1930s, and countless businesses and banks went under. In Europe, there was what well, we all know what happened in Europe in the 1930s. So although these particular disasters, won't it won't happen. Now, if you do not live in an, with an awareness of death, and therefore of the kind that we humans have, and if you don't live trying to tell a story in which your life will end in the way that you now want it to end, and if it ends in that way, you'll be happy, and if it doesn't, you won't, you won't be tempted to seek technological immortality, and you won't be tempted to see human history as a, um, uh, an ongoing story which ends with humans controlling nature or controlling themselves or being capable of immortality. And you won't be as horrified or as frightened, perhaps. You still will be because we're humans, but you won't by times in history when the uh, improvement or progress that you have inherited from the past seems to be going to be suddenly lost. You'll realize uh, that this is actually, historically speaking, normal. You'll realize that this happens from time to time, and you, might, you can resist it, you can join collective movements if you want, you can, you can do various things, or you can do as the cat does, you can try to live well in all circumstances as they unfold, even in Huey. Uh, the cat doesn't seem to try to run away from the uh, uh, war observe. In fact, when it was taken up in a plane, two or three seater plane and flown across a battlefield. It sat curiously on the shoulder of the pilot and watched as it flew over the jungle. It seems to have 
um, taken its new life uh, in, in its full stride. So what I say of cats are is they are egoists aside from their care for their kittens, but they're a strange kind of egoists. They're selfless egoists because they uh, don't have any conception of themselves, a self-image which they're protecting. Unless they, their security, their safety, or their comfort is threatened, they don't act to achieve some uh, uh, image of themselves in themselves or in the eyes of others. And I think we could learn from that. Now, what about cats and us? Now, I mean, what I've said so far, I'm coming to an end now, has suggested that um, they're very, very different from us. In fact, the, that's, I think, one of the reasons why many of us love them. But if they're so different, how can we learn anything from them? If they're so different from us, if they're so radically different from humans in the respect, how can we learn anything from them? Well, we can't become cats. I'm sure that's something that cats would agree with. Uh, we can't become cats, and we shouldn't try and become cats because we are humans. We should try to be, perhaps, um, better humans. But there are certain features of being human, like storytelling, which we might be happier if we were less enslaved to them, less attached to them. In other words, what we can learn from cats, I think, uh, is how to be less attached to the stories we tell of our lives. We may derive great meaning from them in certain ways, the lives we've had, with a partner who's gone or of a, in a place that no longer exists. But um, equally, those stories can somehow, can sometimes uh, prevent us from move, moving on. So although we are storytellers, and we always will be, which is one of the reasons, by the way, why we will, I think, in my view, we will always have religions of one kind or another. Um, because the stories we tell, in a sense, of our, they're, they're all very fragile, and we look for anti-fragile stories. That's what we're looking for in, in religion. We shouldn't be so attached to that part of our natures. Hanging on to our stories is one of the reasons we um, don't uh, enjoy our lives as much as we can. So what would be the meaning of life for a cat-like human being? Well, what's the meaning of life for a cat? It's the sensation of life itself. The meaning is in the sensation of life itself. That is the meaning. Um, nothing else. Now, if you're religious, that will seem to be a very impoverished view. But if you're not religious, this is one way to think of the meaning of life. The Taoists in China thought like that. Some of the ancient Greek skeptics, for example, thought like that. The, the, the meaning of life is in the sensation of life. You then try and find a way to live, being human, you don't already know, um, and a way which enables you to interact uh, with other human beings in a um, beneficial way, in a way which is perhaps uh, even mutually beneficial. So that's, in a way, where I get. Where I get is we love cats because they're not human. Maybe we envy the fact that they're not human, but we can't become cats because they're not, we're, we're so different from them, because the reasons we love them also tell us that we can't be like them. Um, but we can learn from them, even though they're not particularly interested in teaching us. Um, <laughs> Books on cats, I just mentioned that often, you know, uh, this is the first talk I've given on cats, but on other occasions when I've talked about cats with philosophers or others, they say, well, what about books on cats? Um, I haven't found it among philosophers very much. Montaigne is a great writer on cats. You know, Michel de Montaigne, the essayist, wonderful cat. He had his, uh, he loved cats. He had, when my cat plays with me, I never know whether I am playing with it or he with, or she with me. Uh, he thought cats were, in fact, superior to and other animals, many other animals in general, were superior to, uh, to humans. He writes on cats. Um, I'll mention three writers on cats I love. Colette, the film about her at the moment. Unfortunately, a cat only appears for two seconds. But she's, her whole life was spent loving cats and living with cats. And she wrote um, a lovely little novella called Gigi and the Cat, which is about the love triangle, one of whose points is a cat, in which the cat is determined to uh, drive away a gorgeous young woman who is interested in the cats. Uh, some say owner, others say staff. <laughs> um, Patricia Highsmith, the inventor of uh, um, Ripley, um, spent an entire life with cats, loving cats. And she has a variety of stories um, about, uh, short stories about cats, very worth reading. And also Doris Lessing, 
many of you will um, come across. She spent her whole life loving cats, partly in Africa where she lived as a young person. So the kind of lives that cats uh, lived with her in Africa on a farm in the, out, in, the, in, the, in the outback, in the wild, were quite different from the lives her subsequent cats lived when she came to live in London. But, there, but there's a little book where some of her collections are, um, some of her stories are collected. And there are one or two poets. There's a, um, a, a kind of rather rough uh, uh, American co poet called Charles Bukowski. Any of you heard of him? He published a whole book of poems on cats. Um, um, he wasn't too fond of humans, I don't think, but uh, not even of himself. But he was very fond of, very fond of cats, and that's worth reading. So, um, read more about cats. But if you read these writers, fictional and other writers on on cats, but just open your mind to the possibility that cats, knowing so little, know more than we do uh, about how to live a worthwhile life. Thank you. been listening to the British Library.